I told some of the brethren earlier, and I'll tell all of you this, one of the things I don't understand about Oklahoma is I was, uh, next weekend is going to be OU Texas weekend. I was told it was not Texas OU, it's OU Texas, so we'll, we'll get that squared away right now, you know, so it's OU Texas weekend. So I decided what I would do coming to church is I've got satellite radio and I listened to a little Boomer Sooner radio, see what they thought about the thing, because I figured who they would pick. And all they talked about was how that the team needed to improve. The quarterback wasn't good enough. The defense wasn't good enough. The running backs weren't good enough. And I got to thinking, did I miss something? They're undefeated, people. I don't know what you got to do to impress people in Oklahoma. <laughs> but if I'm this kid playing quarterback, I'm going, okay, we're undefeated. And fact is, you've got two undefeated teams in this state. Do you know how giddy they would be in Austin <laughs> if they were undefeated? <laughs> I mean, so so I figure I figure y'all set the bar pretty high, uh, and so I I will try to meet that bar some way. But I don't know how we're how we're going to get over that that particular one. So we're, we've been talking about the millennium and premillennialism this week, and and tomorrow night we're actually going to draw the chart, and we're going to talk about the doctrine of premillennialism when the way it was when I grew up, and and the way that I used to preach it years ago, and and the way that. I think it's pretty much a, the popular view of that. But I decided that before we started into things that were not right, we needed to know what the Bible really said and what was right. So we've already covered the prophecies of Daniel and Isaiah, and we've gone through the prophets, and now we're going to get into the New Testament and what the New Testament has to say about the kingdom of God. I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, the third chapter, and the first verse. This is the days of John the Baptist. And John is going to come. He is the predecessor to the Lord. He is preparing the way of the Lord. He is making the way ready for Jesus to come and start his ministry. And in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Matthew, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I'm going to ask you a simple question. What does at hand mean? If you are reading, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what does that mean? Does at hand mean 2,000 years? 10,000 years? What is at hand? Normally, when we read the term that John was talking about, at hand means nearby. It's close. It's not far away. And in fact, is it's going to be a very short time, a very short number of years, and the kingdom is actually going to be here. So when John said it's at hand in the book of Matthew, it means really nearby. Now when you go to Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 70 in what we call the limited commission. And he's going to send them out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's not going to send them to the way of the Gentiles and all that. But he gave them a message to preach when they go in the limited commission. And it says this in verse 7 of Matthew 10. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? It means the same thing John was talking about. It's nearby. It's not going to be very long, people. The kingdom is at hand. We are closing in. Now, we read about Daniel 490 years ago when he was talking, and he sealed the book up because the time was not yet. Now all of a sudden, here comes John the Baptist, here comes Jesus, and they're preaching, it's at hand, it's nearby. And I think we're all in agreement that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they use that term, at hand, we think that it means close by and nearby. Now that goes real good until you get to the writings of John. In the book of Revelation... And I told you we were going to get there eventually, and we're going to spend more time as this meeting goes on in the book of Revelation. But I want to go to Revelation chapter 1, and I want to show you something that the writer John has to say about this very term that we're talking about. In Revelation chapter 1, I want to go to verse 1, if I can get over there. Revelation 1 and 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servant things that must shortly come to pass. Did I make that up? Did I misread that, folks? He gave and signified to his servant John things that are going to shortly come to pass, 
and yet we've got people preaching that the book of Revelation is still in the future? How come in book of Matthew, and we're going to get, we're going to go, it's going to get better. Stay with me. How come in the book of Matthew, it means nearby, but in the book of Revelation, it means 2,000 years? You see, that's the dilemma that I run into when I was preaching the doctrine of premillennialism. How is it that in the Gospels it means close at hand, it's nearby, shortly come to pass, and then I get to the book of Revelation and it's 2,000 years and maybe even 10,000, who knows? I, I got to see the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I've also had another privilege or curse, depending on how you look at it. I've got to study the Apostolic Fathers. You know, there, if you watch the History Channel, you will find a show every now and then called Banned from the Bible. And they act like there are books that should be in the Bible that, oh no, the religious people, the Christians didn't want them in the Bible, so they banned them. One of them is the epistle of Barnabas. Now, it's obvious when you read this epistle that it was not written by the guy named Barnabas that traveled with Paul. It was not written in the first century. One of these things that these writers had a habit of doing was take a famous name like Barnabas, and they would sign as the epistle of Barnabas. But you know when you read it, Barnabas didn't, didn't write it. Do you know how long the earth's going to stand? Do you know when Jesus is coming back? The, that's one reason it's banned from the Bible, by the way. The epistle of Barnabas tells you when it's going to happen. According to the days of creation. Now, I hadn't figured out exactly how he got this number. But he said the earth is going to stand 7,000 years, and then Jesus is going to come again. He counted the day of rest. <laughs> And I'm wondering, should he have just gone with the six days instead of seven? But you know, when people start making predictions like that, we're, we're still a thousand years away from Barnabas' prediction. That's, you know, that's pretty easy. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen 10,000 years from now. And you prove me wrong? <laughs> but the problem is, when we get to these charts here where the apostles are teaching what the Lord taught, it's going to come as a thief in the night. Nobody knows when that's going to happen. So how did Barnabas know? How did this writer that wrote this so-called epistle know that? And on top of that, the book of Revelation says it was signified to John things that would shortly come to pass. Now let me tell you the problem with premillennialism, one of the big problems. They've got lots of problems, but let me give you one of the big ones. They will start off saying things are signs and symbols. And then all of a sudden, they'll jump to literal. And they jump back and forth. The book of Revelation is signs and symbols, brethren. It was not to be taken literally. And I already told you last night in the book of Isaiah, when the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the lion and the kid and all that stuff, what that meant was your dog's going to eat broccoli. That's not what that's talking about. But what's what when you but and I told you Google commentary on Isaiah 11. That's what most of those commentators say. They start off with the root of Jesse being figurative, talking about Jesus, and then they go literally to dogs eating broccoli. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's exactly what they're saying. Is Revelation going to shortly come to pass or not? Do you believe it? 2,000 years, long time. Well, let's keep going. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. Blessed is he, verse 3, that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. How come in Matthew it means shortly and in Revelation it means 2,000 years? Somebody explain, I can't get it. If this is true, if what I'm reading you is true, and we just flat read it out of the book, then whatever it meant in Matthew, that's what it's going to mean in Revelation, people. These things were shortly coming to pass, and the time was at hand. And I promise you, the people of the first century did not have a clue what a Cobra helicopter was. And I know you think this sermon's off the rails now, but it's not. 
Because that's what I grew up preaching was that the, the locusts with the stingers were cobra helicopters, which are obsolete, by the way, now. Now, you can see them in a museum every now and then, I suppose. They got a lot of weapons. When you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, God rained fire and brimstone upon them. What did that mean? It meant he rained fire and brimstone on them. But when you read it in Revelation, it meant nuclear war. Did God nuke so Sodom and Gomorrah? How come it changed? Where was the change at? You see what I'm getting at? In Matthew, at hand is what Jesus and John preached, and, but in, and, and John the Baptist. And in Revelation, the apostle John uses the same language, but it means something totally different. That's the problem, folks. Now, go to, with me to chapter 22. And chapter 22 should be the last page the last chapter of your Bible, unless you did like I did when I was growing up and I preached out of the book of Concordance one time. But <laughs> other than, um, I, hey, I had lots of problems growing up. I mean, I preached out, out of the book of Philippians too, you know, <laughs> instead of Philippians. So we, we had, we had a, you know, and the book of Job was always a great one for me. But, so I want to look at Revelation chapter 22. Look at verse 6. This is the last page of the book. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants things which must shortly be done. Now, folks, he said it on the first page, and he said it on the last page. Wonder why he had to repeat himself. You reckon he figured folks were not going to get the message? Look at verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of the book, for the time is at hand. Whatever it meant in Matthew, that's what it meant in Revelation. Now I want to, I want to remind you of something. In the book of Daniel, the time was going to be 490 years, roughly, depending on how you count time. And Daniel was told to seal the book because the time is not yet. You just read John, the apostle, saying, don't seal the book because the time's at hand. Now, it has been 2,000 years since that was written. Four times as long as Daniel. And Daniel was told to seal it and John was told not to. Now, I'm going to tell you what I have. I've even had brethren tell me this. Marlon, it says these things will shortly start to happen. Now, folks, I thought we didn't add to and take away from. Did I miss that day? Was I absent that day? It said shortly be done and is at hand, and it said it on page 1 and page 22. Now, let me give you something else, and this is going to get even better as we go along. This book was not divided into chapters and verses when it was written. It was just one letter, like you would send a letter, text message. <laughs> and you wrote 22 pages of text messaging, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. John did not, on page 1 of his letter, and page 22 say it's going to be shortly be done, and the time is at hand, and we're going to get to this, it's going to be better. And then on page 20 say, it's not here yet. You're going to have John contradicting John in the same book. That's the crazy part of this thing. Revelation was written to people in the first century, just like Ephesians and Matthew. And you and I learn from the lessons of Revelation. But it meant something to these people in the first century. And whatever they would have understood it to mean in Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah. Do you realize Zechariah talks about the four horsemen? Take a look at it. Check me out. Whatever they would have understood that to be then, that's what they would have understood when they wrote Revelation. Now, where we're getting the idea that Revelation is still in the future, I don't know. Now, when we get down to chapter 20 and the great white throne judgment and all that, I may have a little different take on that than some do. Some want to apply this stuff to the end of time. I don't think it does. It applied to the first century. 
And when we get there tomorrow night, we're going to talk about what he's saying and what it means. But in Matthew, he said it's going to, the time of the kingdom is at hand. In Revelation, the events of Revelation are at hand. Folks, they got to mean the same thing. You can't make them mean one thing in Matthew and something totally different in the book of Revelation. That's inconsistent. That, that would not be proper to do. So I wanted to, I wanted to share that with you. In the book of Luke, chapter 19, Jesus gives a parable. And I'm going to look about verse 12. And this parable is very much related to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. When they brought one like unto the Son of Man, they brought him before the Ancient of Days in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And there was given to him power in the kingdom. See, he went to the ancient of days to get the kingdom. He didn't come to the earth to get the kingdom. He went to the ancient of days. And in Luke chapter 19 verse 12, Jesus gives a parable about a man, a rich man, and how he was going to go to a far country and receive for himself a kingdom. Jesus did that when he ascended to the Father. When he ascended to the Ancient of Days, ye men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing into the heavens? Remember that in Acts 1? Jesus ascended to the Father and he received a kingdom. Just like Daniel said he would do and just like the parable said would happen. So when Jesus ascended to the Father, he was given the kingdom. And we're going to look at some things in a minute, but I'm going to tell you something. The doctrine of premillennialism has the idea that Jesus will reign when he conquers his enemies. The Bible never says that. The Bible says Jesus will reign till he conquers his enemies. And we're going to get to that in a minute. There's a huge difference in those two concepts, though, folks. That little word is a big deal. Is he going to reign when he conquers them or till he conquers them? Depends on if you believe the Bible or not. But in Luke 19, Jesus himself gave a parable referring to going to a far country and receiving a kingdom. Now, he went ahead and, and he gave, uh, gave things to his servants and all that, and then came back and the servants gave account. But I wanted to center on this part about he went to receive the kingdom. He didn't return to earth to receive the kingdom. You see, the doctrine of premillennialism has Jesus coming to Jerusalem sitting on the literal throne. Oh, and by the way, and this is something don't get a lot of advertisement. When Jesus gets back to Jerusalem and sits on the literal throne of David, we're going back to animal sacrifices. It's not going to be the one that was once offered for the sins of all. We're going to go back to the blood of bulls and goats that's going to save us. I want you to think about that. In the doctrine of premillennialism, Satan is going to be loose for a little season. And he's going to deceive the nations. Well, when Jesus comes back, all the enemies are going to be gone and everybody's Christians. Who's he going to deceive? And see, remember where I grew up, you couldn't fall from grace unless you lived to, live, to be part of the millennium. And then Satan could deceive you. Think that through, people. It gets crazier as you go Along, I want you to know that. In the book of Mark, chapter 9 and verse 1, Jesus is very clear about a, a time frame of what is going to be happening with the kingdom and when the kingdom is going to actually get here. In Mark 9 and verse number 1, I want you to see what Jesus had to say. Mark 9 and 1. I have a very big Bible. It takes two pages to write Jesus wept, so it takes me a while to turn anymore. That way I can see it. Don't feel bad for me because I can't see because I make up for it by not being able to hear. But at any rate, in Mark 9 and 1, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. He said, Some of you standing here, will not taste of death till you've seen the kingdom. It will come in your lifetime. Now, there is a major religion in this country 
that believes that one of these people is 2,000 years old. This religion preaches that John the Apostle has not died and he's still alive. And they base it on John 21, where when Peter was told what manner of death he should die, Peter looked at the Lord and he looked at the disciple whom he loved and said, what shall this man do? And the Lord said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And then it goes on to say, Jesus didn't say he wouldn't die, but he said, if I will that he will. But this major religion has still got 2,000-year-old people. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. 2,000 years old makes Methuselah look like a kid. Think that one through. Methuselah was 969, if I'm not mistaken. And now this guy's over double that age? I mean, Methuselah was a teenager when he died compared to that. You see how far people will go to keep this stuff alive? John's not alive. John ran the race. John wrote what he wrote. And John's with the Lord. But he's not alive, folks. And the kingdom came in the lifetime of some of these people. But you've only got one or two choices. Either it came in their lifetime, or some of them are getting pretty old. I guarantee you that. They're 2,000 years old. And, but he said it's going to come with power. What do you have in mind when he said it's going to come with power? Electric lights? That would have been nice. I bet they would have liked that. You know what I mean? The Lord had something in mind when he said it's going to come with power. In the book of Acts chapter 1, I want you to turn with me. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Bible says this, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And we've already talked about we are the uttermost part of the earth in our part of the world here. So, But he said you're going to receive power when the Holy Ghost comes. What did Jesus say? Some of you standing here will see the kingdom come with power. He's talking about that receiving of the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And when the day of Pentecost, now that's important, folks. The day of Pentecost was a 24-hour day. That's what it was. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one Honda Accord. Okay, sorry. That's the only, that's the only apostle joke I got. So y'all going to, hey, hey, you'll be driving down the road tomorrow going, that, that was funny. So, but they were all in one accord, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. Now, let's follow the Lord's reasoning here. Some of you standing here will not die. Now, some did die. Judas was dead by then. Of the 12, I mean, he was gone. But some of you will not die till you've seen the kingdom come with power. The power is going to come with the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. What does that tell you? It tells me one of two things. Either Jesus was a liar and mistaken, or the kingdom came on the day of Pentecost, because that's when the power came. Now, do you remember in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, where Jesus, about verse 13, asked him, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Oh, you're John the Baptist, one of the prophets, something like that, right? And Jesus asked an important question. And he said, Who do you think I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus told him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then here it comes. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
and I will give unto you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 14 of Acts 2. Who preaches? And Simon Peter standing, or Peter standing up with the eleven opened his mouth and he preached what we call the first gospel sermon. That is the first time that somebody preached the Messiah has come, died, been buried, and rose again. So you got the guy, you got the right guy preaching, you got the power, just like Jesus said, and you got it on the day of Pentecost. Were they put in the kingdom? Look at verse 47. And I want you to know, I prefer the King James to this because I don't like added to their number. It waters down what I really think the message of Acts 2 is. And it may be more accurate to say added to their number. But the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. When Peter preached that, he used the keys to open the doors to something. And it was the church. But Jesus said that's when the kingdom would come. You know why? And we're going to get to this in a minute. Because the church and the kingdom are the same thing. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. You have a blessed privilege that you can be part of the kingdom of God. You can be part of the church. But I think sometimes we kind of take being a part of the church for granted. Let me tell you something happened to me recently. Bev and I, our youngest son, is married to Sean Zebox oldest daughter, and I guess that makes me and Sean, since they're having a baby, makes us granddad-in-laws. We're related some way now for some reason, but you can figure that one out. But we went out to Amarillo to see Chance and Alexis, and we, we spent the day with them. It was on a Tuesday. Got up. We, well, I was tired. Man, we drove out there. I, I, I don't mind being in Tulsa, and I don't mind being in Gunner, but I don't like the trip between, and so because it always tires me out. But at any rate, we were tired. And so Wednesday morning, we got up, we had breakfast with Chance and Alexis and visited with the folks there at Wheeler. Then we packed up and we headed home. And for five hours, I told Bev, I'm not going to church tonight. It's Wednesday. We have Wednesday night services in Gunner. I said, I'm not going to church tonight. I'm tired. Bev, I'm give out. I am wore out. I'm a heart patient. And I want you to know this heart patient thing works really good when you need it. So you might want to put that one in your back pocket every now and then, you know. I'm a heart patient. I'm tired. I can't catch my breath, you know. Oh, this is the big one, you know. And so I'm not going, to, and for five hours, I'm telling her, I'm not going to church. And I told her, I said, the brethren ain't going to miss me one night. The church will still be there Sunday, and I'll go then. So we walk in the door. And my little seven-year-old blonde-headed granddaughter comes to me and goes, Granddad, do you know what happened to school today? And I go, no, honey, what happened to school? And she said, our teacher said that she does not give homework on Wednesdays. And I go, well, that's nice, dear. Why does she not do that? And she said, so we can go to church. <laughs> now, remember, for five hours, I'm not going. I want you to know that. And then I thought, okay, okay, we can, we can probably work around this a little bit. And then she goes, Granddad, our teacher asked us a question. And I said, what did she ask you, honey? And she said, she goes, how many of you go to church on Wednesday night? She goes, in the whole class, I was the only one that raised my hand. And I looked at Bev and I said, get ready, we're going to church. <laughs> But you see how easy it is sometimes to be tired or sometimes I don't want to go to church. That's the kingdom, folks. That's being a part of the kingdom. And I want you to know, yes, evangelists and elders and everybody else, sometimes we get tired. And sometimes we don't feel like going. And we take for granted this great privilege that we're given here to be able to be a part of the powerful kingdom that came with power on the day of Pentecost. And I want you to know, I went out to get some more of our luggage, and I looked up in the sky and go, I got it, I got it. Because God has this way of humbling Marlon. I don't know if he does the rest of you that way or not, but he does me every now and then. And sometimes he uses us out of the mouth of babes. A seven-year-old was teaching an elder in the church that should have known better how important the kingdom of God is. Now, folks, it's a blessing and a privilege. You don't have a right to be here. You don't. It is not in the Constitution. 
Well, maybe. But you don't have a right to be a part of God's kingdom. It's a privilege. And we need to treat it that way, folks. And we need to have a little more, a little more thought behind what we're doing when I'm tired and I really don't feel, feel like going. I feel like, don't feel like being a part of it anymore. It came with power. And it came on the day of Pentecost. Now, I want you to go to the book of Revelation with me. I told you it was going to get better. Oh, it's going to get better. It, you know, Revelation has told us these things are shortly going to come to pass, and these things are at hand. We've already talked about that, right? You want the kick in the head? Here comes the kick in the head in verse number 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom. I'm your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom. Did I miss something? John thought he was in the kingdom. He wrote to the seven churches of Asia, and he thought they were in the kingdom. So here's the deal. On page one of his book, his letter, on page one of his text message, he says, I'm in the kingdom with you. And then on page 20, he says the kingdom's not here yet. Now, folks, I ain't making this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. And that's exactly what we used to preach. When it was convenient, John was in the kingdom. But when we got to Revelation 20, it ain't here yet. And it's still not here, and it's way into the future sometime. Who knows when? But John thought he was in the kingdom. And this is the guy that wrote the revelation. Why would he say he's in the kingdom if the kingdom hadn't been there yet? In the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1, we're going to look at verse number 13. Now this is the apostle Paul, and we're going to get to a comparison here in just a second. But in Colossians 1 and 13, who hath delivered us, talking about Jesus, from the power of darkness, that is sin, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Paul said he was in the kingdom. And he was writing to the Colossian church, to the Colossi. He said they're in the kingdom. Now, were John and Paul mistaken? And all these writers that you read about and commentators that you can read about today with the late great planet Earth and the Left Behind series, they got it right and the apostles missed it? That's the position you're taking, people. It's time to wake up and smell the coffee. That's what it's time to do. Now, it gets better. Look at verse 14 in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. When he forgives your sins, you know what he does? He translates you into the kingdom. Because the kingdom came on the day of Pentecost. Now I want to remind you of something. This is why I like the King James. We have the forgiveness of our sins through his blood in Colossians that puts us in the kingdom. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved in Acts 2. The saver added to the church and the saver translated into the kingdom. Why is that? Because they're one and the same. They are one and the same. Now I've got this chart up here and y'all can tell that me and Pat Manning are a lot alike because <laughs> we go to elaborate charts. We love charts and all that. This is Peter and what he said right here. This is Paul in the middle. And this is John over here on this side. One of the things I wanted to show by going through the prophecies that we did earlier in the week, the prophets were in accord. A Messiah was coming. A Savior was coming. And he was going to have a kingdom that would fill the whole earth and the mountain of the Lord's house and all nations will flow into it. And in that kingdom... It doesn't matter what country you're from. They're not going to do war with each other because they're from different countries. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares and so on 
and so forth. And I wanted to show that the prophets were in accord with the message they preached. A Messiah is coming, and he's got a kingdom that's coming. And they would have loved to have been part of it. I want to show that the apostles are in accord too. Now, if you look at 2 Peter, and we're not going to read all these verses. It gets a little bit long. We're not going to read all the verses, but I want to show you this. Peter talks about, and I want you to know, <laughs> I believe in global warming. <laughs> I believe it's going to get real hot one of these days. Read 2 Peter chapter 3, 4 to 14. The elements and the earth and the works that are therein are going to melt with fervent heat. Now, that's global warming. I want you to know that. But he talks about the people that we ought to be. But he says this, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night. I want you to know that Paul uses the same language. I, want, I do want to read the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the reason is, this is the rapture. The, rap, the word rapture literally means a catching away. Okay? And the doctrine has it this way. The saved will be caught away in the rapture, and everybody else will be left. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. Now, I'm going I'm to stop right there. He didn't say that we would not sorrow when we lost somebody close to us. But we're not going to sorrow as others that have no hope. And they were worried about, okay, some have died. Are, are, are they, did they just miss it? And Paul is saying, no, don't worry about that. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There it is. There's the rapture right there. You see, Marlon, it doesn't say anything about the wicked or anything about the lost. Now, do you remember what I told you about Revelation? I'm going to tell you that about Thessalonians. Thessalonians was a letter. It was written in one letter. It did not get divided into chapters and verses for a number of years later. So let's keep reading in verse chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, now he's just talked about the dead in Christ rising and so forth like that. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you, you're, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The exact same language that Peter used. Were they mistaken? Peter and Paul are in agreement. Now let's go a little further. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And you can keep reading from there. He did talk about the lost. He talked about what was going to happen with those that were the children of God. The dead will rise. They'll be caught up together with the living and to be with the Lord forever. But there is coming a judgment on the ones that are lost. Sudden destruction. Now, this is John, chapter 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Here's my point, folks. They all, we got Peter, Paul, and John. No, that's not the Beatles. <laughs> you, you'll like that one tomorrow, too. But Peter, Paul, and John, they're apostles of the Lord, and they're in total agreement. When the Lord comes, there's going to be salvation to some and destruction to others. There's not going to be more time on the earth. One of the dangers of premillennialism is it preaches a second chance. It's not going to happen. When the Lord comes, it's going to stop. 
Now I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. And this is the Apostle Paul. And we're not going to read everything that he has to say, but I want to read some of this. Chapter 15, 23 to 25. And I want you to tell me what I've missed here. Okay? It says this, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, that's talking about the resurrection, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end. I missed something. When Christ comes again, according to Paul, then comes the end. When the Lord comes again, the heavens and the earth will pass away. John said the, the graves are open and everybody will be standing before God to receive what they've done. Then cometh the end, folks. He's not coming to set the kingdom up. When he comes again, it's the end. And we need to be prepared. That's what Peter said. Seeing we believe these things, what manner of people ought you to be, that you be found of him without spot and blameless. And you'll be without spot and blameless, not because of your righteousness, but because of his righteousness and his blood. We need to be prepared for that. Let's go a little further. It's even better. For then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God. Now, folks, I want to ask you a question. How can he deliver a kingdom to God that he hadn't even set up? That's the problem. The kingdom's here. It's here now. And you can be part of it. And when he's talking about delivering the kingdom back to God, he's talking about delivering his people. That's what he's talking about. And that's exactly what all three of these guys, these apostles, were teaching. That's what the Lord taught. He's not coming to set up a kingdom. It's here. He's going to come. It's going to come to end. And he's going to deliver it back to God. Now, when you get down to verses 50 to 54, this is when he talks about mortal putting on immortality, corruptible putting on incorruption. That's that new body. He said it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be quick. I understand that twinkling of an eye has been translated sometimes as blinking and it takes less than a quarter of a second. <laughs> That's quick. That's real quick. But I want you to see that Peter and Paul and John and Jesus taught the same thing about the kingdom. And you can be part of it if you want to be. But he's not going to make you. He's going to go a little, I want to go a little further here. In verse number 25 of 1 Corinthians 15, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He's not going to reign when the enemies are defeated. He's going to reign till they're defeated. That's a big difference, folks. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you believe the doctrine of premillennialism, Jesus isn't reigning. Jesus is not yet King of kings and Lord of lords. And I really don't want to be in that group that would deny the King and the Lord of lords. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and his kingdom is here now. And he is on the throne and reigning now, just like the apostles said that he would. I got to thinking about some things. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 2, the letter is written, under the church of God at Corinth. It's written to the church, isn't it? Yeah, it's written to the church. If you get to chapter 10, verse 21, he's going to talk about you cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord and the table of devils. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. And what he's talking about is the idolatrous ways that the Corinthians had. He said you can't go worship Zeus at 9 o'clock and then meet with the church at 10.30. It won't work. You can't do both. You can't go take the table of devils and the table of the Lord. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11, he gets to verse 23. He's teaching the Corinthians. He tells them, I'm going to deliver to you that which I received of the Lord. The same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Sound familiar? Oh, we're talking the communion, aren't we? Where was that done? At the church in Corinth. 
Now stay with me. In Acts 26, 27 to 29, Jesus told them to eat the bread and drink the cup. He said, but I will not drink and eat with you this until I do it anew in the kingdom. The bread and the fruit of the vine was in the kingdom. But yet in Corinthians, it was in the church. And the reason is the church and the kingdom are the same thing. And when the church was established in Acts chapter 2, the kingdom was set up. And what the prophets had seen and foretold came to pass in Acts chapter 2. Salvation is in the kingdom. Redemption through His blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. You'll be translated into the kingdom. When you obey the gospel, you'll be added to the Lord's church. And by the way, I'm not going to do the adding. Where I grew up, we used to do it like this. I don't know if y'all have ever seen this before, but you might ought to be able to see it now. Somebody would come forward. They would pray a prayer. And then they want to be a part of the church. So I would say, so-and-so has come forward. They are a candidate for baptism. All in favor? Now, my dad did it a little different than that. He would say, all in favor. Of course, there are no no's, so forget that. And <laughs> he didn't give them a chance. But there were times that people did vote no. There were times when they said, all in favor, and people go, no. We don't want that person part of our church. That is recorded history, folks. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Lord adds to his church. The Lord adds to his kingdom. It's not me that's going to add you to the kingdom. I'm not going to vote on that. I don't know where exactly that... I, I do have one verse for it, but I don't want to get... It is so It is so far... Oh, okay, I'll get to it. It's in Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius and verse 48. And Peter says, Can any man forbid water? All in favor say I. I'm, you think I'm making this stuff up? People, you can't make this stuff up. If you really think that's what Peter was saying, have a vote on it, and then we'll let Gentiles in. That's not what happened. When you are forgiven of your sins and you are washed in the blood, God will add you to his church, to his kingdom, and you are a part of the kingdom of God, and you are a servant of the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Folks, I hope that one thing you got out of what we talked about tonight is the importance of the kingdom, the importance of the church. Don't take for granted what you've got. It's a blessing. And these apostles were part of it. John the Baptist would have loved to have seen it. Daniel would have loved to have seen it. Ezekiel, Zechariah, Isaiah. But they didn't get to be a part of the kingdom like you. You've got that privilege right now. And the blood of Jesus is open to all. And God will receive anyone that will come.